My name is Peggy Burkhardt, and I'll be your moderator today. We're looking to for forward to hearing from our speaker and panelists today. And we will have questions once the presentation is complete. And there'll be plenty of time for questions. Please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Michelle Bishop and Dr. Sung Wan Choi. Dr. Michelle Bishop is a clinical and health psychologist with 25 years of experience helping patients and families coping with the psychosocial aspects of cancer survivorship and caregiving. She has spent 10 years as a research assistant professor in hematology oncology at the University of Florida, studying the quality of life of blood and marrow transplant survivors and their caregivers. Dr. Sung, Sung Wan Choi is an associate professor in the Division of Pediatric Hematology Oncology BMT program at the University of Michigan Medical Center. Her, recent, her research focuses on the prevention and treatment of GVHD. I will now have, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Michelle Bishop, come on up. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you all for being here today. I hope it's been a good day so far in terms of the conference. Good. Uh, BMT InfoNet and their team, Sue Stewart and, and her team, are just uh, amazing at what they do, their organization and these conferences that they put together. So I, I thank them for that, and I certainly thank them for the opportunity and privilege to be here with you today. So today, this hour is devoted completely to you, to all of you who care for, provide love, care, support, uh, management coping for those who um, have who are dealing with GVHD, um, and we wanted to make sure to have a, an hour devoted to um, acknowledging and validating your very special role, really a critical role, your experience and all that you do, and you do so very much. And we know it's extremely difficult to manage um, and to balance the needs of your loved one and your own needs. And so the focus today for the first half is really on um, how, how the importance of self-care and how do you take care of yourself while you're trying to take care of your loved one and, and everyone else. Um, it is no small task. And, um, and so I hope that you leave here today uh, certainly feeling that, that um, you've been heard and you've been given some ideas for how you might care for yourself as you're on this journey and some resources that are out there available just for you. I just wanted to start, though, in terms of the term family caregiver, because a lot of folks are um, uncomfortable or don't identify with the word caregiver. We tend to think caregiver. We tend to think uh, professional caregiver, so a, a nurse or a home health care aide who's, who's paid to come into the home and provide care. Most family members, at least that I work with, will say, well, I'm, I'm not the caregiver. I'm the spouse or I'm the husband. It's just, it's just what I do. It's just my job. And, and that's absolutely true. Part of the, the good point of using the word caregiver is, is to try to identify and um, delineate that there are, though, a number of roles and a number of tasks that you are taking on in this process that are really above and beyond what you might have expected in your role as a family member. Um, and, and so it's and I'm also using a very broad definition of, of caregiving, so providing support, help, and care, not just hands-on caregiving. Um, and in terms of who, again, broad definition, spouses, partners, parents, adult children, siblings, friends, you might be somebody who's the primary caregiver, so sort of the go-to person, secondary, or maybe um, a, a more uh, peripheral family member, even somebody who lives far away, um, but still wants to provide support and care and is trying to figure out how to do that. So there are lots of different types of, of care, caregivers and caregiving. The two really kind of important things I wanted to highlight was we're talking about what we call in, in the medical field informal caregivers. So you're not paid professionals, and you don't necessarily have a degree in caregiving. You're really learning on the job uh, oftentimes. Um, and the big thing is you aren't a professional caregiver who is on the job and then goes home. You're on the job 24-7. You are living this too. This is your experience too. And so that complicates things, or that adds to the experience, I should say. 
Um, and so we struggle in the medical field to figure out how, what kind of word to use, what label to use. Sometimes we talk about co-survivors because you're surviving too, or forgotten survivors. Um, we've talked about second order patients. So we have the primary patient and then the second order patient. You know, it's a struggle. And so, um, you know, please understand that when we use the term, or at least when I'm using the term family caregivers, I'm trying to use it broadly and really trying to acknowledge you not just in the roles of what you provide in this situation, but also you who are experiencing it and living it every day. Um, and really, it's a, it's a family affair. You know, I think um, we, we might sometime do a session that's uh, coping with GVHD, a family affair, because it's all of you muddling through trying to figure it out. Um, each, uh, you know, each individual in the family, um, you have shared experiences and you have unique experiences. So obviously today we're focusing on your, your unique experiences. So if you're here today um, and you're dealing with GVHD, it means you started this journey quite some time ago probably. And that was with, uh, with a diagnosis of cancer and then BMT and then GVHD. And I think one of the things, one of the, the, the framework that I like to use is thinking about it as these are chapters in a long journey, in a long narrative. And this, the first chapter started some time ago. And of course, was a major life stressor, a life-shattering event, event, ripple effect affected every aspect, every dimension of your quality of life. And of, and of course, as I said, affects both the quality of life of survivors and family caregivers. When you moved into kind of the BMT arena, um, the, the family caregiving role, your role, became that much more critical, that much more important. Indeed, many transplant centers will not transplant a patient if there is not a designated caregiver. So you are, you are front and center. You are critical to the process, um, certainly to the survival, but the health, the adjustment, and the quality of life of the patient. And as you know, because you've been through it, um, you end up taking care of everything else while the patient is focused on, on, on surviving and then getting well. Um, the thing is, it doesn't occur in a vacuum. It occurs in the midst of ongoing life roles, right? Life goes on, and you're also trying to manage those things. And there are new roles, added roles, and then there are changes in roles. Um, so what are we talking about, all these roles? It's, you know, being a caregiver is not a single role. It's a whole host, and this is only a small sample of those. Of course, the, yes, providers of hands-on care. There are nursing tasks. There are physical hands-on care that, that you, you find yourself doing, and hopefully your, your team, transplant team, has, has taught you to do them. But beyond that, there are many, many additional roles. So certainly one is being a patient advocate, being the voice of the patient when the patient is very ill and may not be able to speak up for themselves or being, a, you know, providing additional information because of the unique perspective you have, living and, and, and observing and um, being with the, with the survivor. You might be gathering information and then mo and monitoring symptoms and then communicating that to the medical team, which is really a critical role because oftentimes without that information, you know, they would not have uh, what they need to make decisions, healthcare decisions. You also are the communicator often to the larger support network that you have. So the communicator with family and friends. Um, that can be a, a positive role because you are receiving, hopefully, support um, and concern. But it can also be stressful because you are managing uh, emails and phone calls and texts that are saying, what's going on and how are things? And then you're trying to respond. Um, and so we're going to talk about some ways to, to manage some tools that are helpful to manage that. Um, certainly, you know, they're the hands-on task, driver, cook, medication manager, appointment scheduler. A lot of families talk about how this becomes a full-time job, or it feels like a full-time job. Um, and then, you know, the one on the bottom, provider of psychosocial support, interestingly, you know, the research shows that that actually can be really stressful. So you are often the cheerleader or the, the person trying to lift the spirits for your loved one, which is a wonderful gift, but it's really hard to do when you yourself are scared or you yourself are tired or stressed um, and you're trying to not show that and you're trying to be up for your loved one. And so that can be very, very stressful. So that was chapter two. Chapter three, the special challenges of GVHD, which is, of course, why you're all here. 
um, as you know, it's like a whole new illness that you're dealing with, right? It's not the end of, um, of treatment. It's the beginning um, of, of some new things. And those new things can be very, very challenging, unexpected, unpredictable, uncertain. Um, often multiple body systems are affected. And they can be very debilitating and really affect um, certainly well-being, but also uh, quality of life and lifestyle, right? If it's difficult for, the, for your loved one to walk or to go outside or to be around other people, um, that affects your lifestyle, and that can be very isolating. And so one of the things that families talk about um, and express is feeling a great deal of isolation when they're dealing with GBHD. One thing is most family and friends don't get it. They don't understand. They don't know what GVHD is, is. They don't understand why does it keep happening? Why isn't it over yet? Um, you know, wait, weren't, weren't you, you know, weren't, weren't, weren't you just dealing with that a month ago? And so that can be very hard. Even your medical, medical community that you go home to if you're home from the transplant center may not know all of the, um, you know, the special details and information about what you're dealing with. So the, the go-to people, the medical people, um, might not have the information you need, so you may have to go to see specialists. So that's isolating, and that can be scary. Um, it can be isolating if, if the loved one is immunocompromised and you can't go out um, in crowds. It can be isolating socially and so forth, and that's, that's one of the, um, I think, number one challenges in terms of kind of psychosocial issues. The other thing is, as you know, treatments themselves can be challenging. So the condition's tough, but the treatment's tough, too. So sometimes people talk about roid rage. So you know, the, the, the treatment effects from steroids and how it can change how someone looks and feels and, and behaves. And, um, and that can be really tough for the patient and for, of course, the family member. Um, it can, and, and certainly, it can be long-term chronic. Um, and so that caregiving burden is different than chapter one and two, but it can increase in some ways and it can be extended. We don't have a lot of data yet, unfortunately, on the direct impact of living with GVHD on family caregivers. Um, Dr. Choi actually just completed uh, gathering data on 1,300, I think, just about family members who are dealing with it. So we're very excited that she's doing that work and there are more studies in the pipeline um, to identify uh, what, what some of the challenges are which are going to help us to then develop um, uh, education and interventions. Um, but we have done some studies, um, and I was involved in one many years ago, that looked at uh, long-term BMT survivors. These were folks who were 2 to 23 years post-transplant, and we had a subset of spouse caregivers that we also um, gathered information from. And what we found was, at the time, really shocking, it's not going to be shocking to you, but that um, the spouse caregivers, even on an average of seven years after transplant, were describing fatigue cognitive difficulty, sleep and sexual problems themselves. It wasn't just the survivors. Um, and in, in, in some ways, they were worse off from the survivors in that they reported less social support and more loneliness, and they were less likely to be getting help. And I think part of that is because in our medical system, we identify the patient as sort of the focus, and we don't recognize that the family is dealing with it too, and that they also need support. Um, and so they get kind of lost in that. Um, in terms of parent uh, caregivers, um, which I don't have on this slide, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I meant to put it on here, but the rates of post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic stress symptoms, so a kind of lower level of, of that um, disorder, are, is higher than what you'd, you know, you'd expect, um, obviously, in, in, the, in the normal population. Um, and I think it's because parents are witnessing their, their children go through this and are helpless to do anything about it um, and that it is literally traumatic. Um, we know studies on chronic caregiving, so not necessarily cancer BMT, show that it can have, the chronic caregiving can have a negative impact on the immune system and the health of, of caregivers, which is why self-care is so important. Um, and so um, that is something that is relevant to you all. 
Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. I have found studies that show that caregivers can actually be hardier and some even live longer than non-caregivers. And what that, I think, is about is the resilience factor, is if, if we find good ways to cope, there are actually um, positive benefits and rewards, sense of, of purpose, a sense of, um, of meaning and so forth that can come from that, and we'll talk about that. So bottom line, not a surprise to you, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And indeed, I would say, in this case, it's an ultra marathon. So one of those 50 milers or 100 milers, not just a, a you know, 26 one. Um, and so it really is learning about how to live with GVHD, how to adjust to that ongoing journey, and then what can you do to keep going and um, maintain a good quality of, care, quality of life. So self-care, it's vital. Um, the patient's health and well-being depends on it, as does yours. And you know, we use the analogy, put your oxygen mask on first. And I think it's a good one in that if you really think about if you're on a plane and it loses cabin pressure, if, if you're taking too long putting your, your, helping somebody else with their oxygen mask, you could pass out, and then you're in trouble and they're in trouble. So the analogy is a good one. But I have to tell you, when I was putting these slides together and I was thinking about the third chapter of GVHD, I was thinking of it, there's probably a better analogy, and that's of car maintenance. So if you think about it, if you have a car that has four flat tires, is low on oil and low on gas, and you keep driving that car, it's going to be a problem. First of all, it's going to take a lot more energy to get that car to go where it needs to go. It's going to start to really wear and tear and damage the car. And eventually, it's going to stop. And if you push it too hard, it's going to stop permanently. And I think about that in terms of what you all are dealing with, because it really is the long haul. And, and you, know, you are that car. And, and self-care isn't just in the short term in an in acute crisis setting. This is self-care for the long haul. This is how do you keep those tires pumped up? How do you keep the gas in the gas tank and the oil you know, in the car so that it can keep going? And it'll be a much more efficient and much easier. Um, and it won't, it won't have um, caused such wear and tear. And we're going to get to some of the ideas for that. But what are the barriers? There are huge barriers. Self-care is so hard. Why is it hard? Um, first and foremost, I think people feel like they don't have time. <laughs> They're doing so much that how can they possibly take time for themselves? Or they feel that it's selfish to do so. so. Um, or if they, if they don't do all these things, it won't get done. Um, so there's no choice. Not wanting to bother other people, not forgiving oneself if something were to happen. If you were to leave your loved one in order to do something to take care of yourself and something happened, that you would feel guilty. Oftentimes, families, members will say, you know, they feel guilty if, 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 they, if they're tired or if they, you know, if they complain or if they take time for themselves because, my gosh, compared to what their loved one's dealing with, you know, it's small potatoes. But again, if you don't take care of yourself, not only are you in trouble, but your loved one is in trouble. And so it really is important. And there are resources to help you with it. So these are just some highlights um, in terms of different ideas for promoting strength, stamina, resilience. The first and foremost is information. Um, and that's what you're doing right now. That's why you're here. You are equipping yourself, understanding what you can expect. What is this all about? What does this mean? What is GVHD? What do I need to look for? What can I expect? What can I do about it? Empowers you. It, rather than feeling overwhelmed and paralyzed, you have a sense of, OK, this is challenging, but I have an idea that this is normal, or I have an idea of what I can do about it. And that really changes things. Um, it helps with preparation problem solving, certainly increases a sense of control, um, and decreases anxiety and, and isolation. The good news is there are some really, really fabulous sources of information. And you found one of them, which is BMT InfoNet, and the other is National BMT Link. Um, Peggy is here representing that organization. Um, the third that I think of is, is Be the Match, which was formerly a National Maradona Program. So these organizations are, are just absolutely phenomenal with the, the type of information that they provide, uh, certainly written uh, webinars, recorded um, um, you know, information, the symposia, the, the conferences that they put on, um, video learning library, and so forth. And many are specific to GVHD and caregiving. And there's a handout that I hope you guys have that looks like this. 
um, that has a list of the specific resources that I highlighted um, from these organizations. Um, and if you don't have that, we can hopefully get you one. Um, one of the resources that these organizations provide that I'd like to really highlight is the peer-to-peer -peer information support. Um, there really isn't a substitute, I think, for talking with someone or talking with another family member that has been through what you've been through, especially given that this is like a rare disease and there are so few people who have experienced it and who really understand. Um, when you talk to someone who's been through it, they just get it. You don't have to explain. Um, they might have tips and tricks. There might be things that, that they learned along the way that would be helpful. You might have things that, that you could offer, and that can feel good. Um, certainly helps to decrease the sense of isolation. And what's great is you can do it by phone or by internet in the comfort of your own home on your schedule. Going to a local support group is fantastic, but it can be challenging in terms of getting there. Um, and you know, if you miss it, it only meets once a month and you miss it and then you have to wait another month. And will you find another family that's going through what you're going through? So the likelihood of finding that family and, and finding a match with all the different um, circumstances you're dealing with are, are, are very high with these programs. And I have those programs listed as well as a, a couple of others um, on that handout. And I do hope you will avail yourself after this session of the networking groups because that is that same idea as a chance for you all to meet each other, talk to one another, and, and share common experiences. Now, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I'm going to put a plug in for counseling, but I'm going to talk about it maybe from a little bit of a different um, way that you might have thought about it. We often think about um, psychotherapy or counseling um, as a treatment when, when you're really in trouble, when something's really wrong. And I want to talk about it in terms of it being a resource. Th something you might think about building in as a resource for you all every step of the way. Um, a lot of the folks that I see, that, that is what, that what we do. And what, what the feedback I get is that you know, to have a place that is safe, that's confidential, that's just for you, that's scheduled, which means you know, it's prioritized and, 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 you, and you go to it, you make a point to go to it, scheduled your time where the focus is on you and, and there's, no, there's no agenda and you don't have to worry about what the therapist thinks. If you're talking to friends and family, which is wonderful, you may not share absolutely everything or they might have an opinion or, you know, it's, it's different. It's helpful, but it's different. Um, and so individual counseling, I think, as a resource, as a place to to express, process, emotions, thoughts, feelings, um, problem solve, um, it's, it's, it really can be invaluable. Of course, family and coupling, couples counseling can be helpful too to problem solve. Um, and the good news is insurance um, you know, usually covers it. Now every state is different, every insurance plan is different. Um, there are psychologists and social workers and mental health practitioners that specialize in working with cancer patients and caregivers like I do. But even generalists are going to be able to support you in ways that, um, that might be unique and might be helpful to you. There are also free cancer-related counseling, um, brief counseling services available, um, and those are on the handout. Um, so Be, be the Match has uh, terrific people who who totally get uh, BMT, because that's the, that's the world they work in, um, who, can, who can, can provide some short-term counseling for you, uh, as well as Cancer Care and some of the, the can other cancer organizations. Now, obviously, there are other sources of support in terms of people support, friends, family, neighbors, coworkers. You know, we can, again, think broadly. And they can provide a whole host of types of support. But I do understand that you know, the GVHD landscape is different, and because it tends to be longer term, um, and folks don't always understand what's happening or that it's still happening, and sometimes they might fatigue, in a sense, in terms of providing support, there are some unique challenges to that. And it can be hard to ask for help and to keep asking. So one tool that you may or may not know about is um, setting up web pages through, for instance, caringbridge.org or mylifeline.org. Um, they're free, they're very user friendly, and it's, um, Facebook is great, but Facebook isn't always as private as a, as, a, as a web page like this is. And what's nice about it is you can post updates um, and, and you can even post educational materials if you would like to help your, your support uh, community understand better what's going on. 
Um, you can post pictures. Um, sometimes families use it almost like a journal where they're kind of documenting their experience. But your support community can go and see, wow, they're still dealing with this. Or, oh, I'm so glad to see that they got some help with this. Um, it's a place where you could also post things that you might need. Some of them, like My Lifeline, has a, uh, a schedule, I mean, a calendar in it where you can actually put places where you could maybe use some help. Um, Lots of Helping Hands is another website that does that. Um, what I think might be different in terms of GVHD versus, let's say, when you first get back from the transplant center is you might need different kinds of help um, and also that it might be good to think about putting in um, ongoing help rather than you know, a meal here and there or help here and there where you keep having to, you know, to ask. Um, but think about, you know, for maybe this period of time, my loved one can't do the yard work anymore. And it really would be such a help if I could get my neighbors to do that. And so you just build it in. You just ask them, could you just take this over for now? Um, and, and then when things get better, you can take it off the table in a sense. Um, you know, the other thing is to be ready when people say, lots of people say, well, let me know how I can help. Well, that's hard because then the onus is on you, right? And to go to them and to say, oh, so could you do this? If you have just a couple things in mind um, when they say it, you might say, you know what? Gosh, I'm so, I really appreciate that. Is there any way you could run a few errands for me or you could sit with my loved one um, next week because I actually have you know, this going on or could you pick up you know, Johnny from soccer? Um, and so kind of to be ready and because people want to help, they just don't know what you need and they don't know what to do. The other thing is to, you know, that you can be creative. So I had um, a family that really needed help actually with yard work and they didn't want to keep asking. So what they did was um, seasonally, they basically had a clean up, the, clean up their yard party. They invited everybody that they could think of, made a big day of it. Of course, you know, many hands made little work. Everyone had a blast, you know, raking and trimming and all this kind of stuff. And then they provided pizza and drinks and ice cream. And it ended up being this whole social event. And I think for the family, it, it felt better because it, it can be hard to receive help and hard to be in a position where you need help. Um, and this made it fun and it made it this community gathering. Um, and of course, everybody who volunteered had a great time and felt really good you know, that they could do something. Um, so in terms of self-care, um, I think it's important to think broadly. You know, we often think self-care, we think more physical. But to think self-care in terms of emotional care for yourself, social care, spiritual care, um, my guess is you check in with your loved one every day. I wonder if you could try to practice checking in with yourself every day. So almost like doing a body scan, you kind of check in. What, what am I feeling? What, what's going on in my body? What, what kind of, do I feel tired? Do I feel irritable? Do I feel sad? You know, what's happening? And think of it like as lights going on the dashboard, right? We're back to the car maintenance analogy. So that if, if something's lighting up on the dashboard, it's telling you, watch out, here's a low battery or here's low oil. We need to draw attention to this. We need to do something about this. There's an imbalance. Um, and then, as with the social support, thinking about how do you build in self-care as a preventive, not as a stopgap measure when things get really bad. Um, some of the signs of burnout you're probably aware of, and this is like the dashboard lights going on, so if you're feeling exhausted or changes in weight or, again, irritability, crying spells, certainly if you start to, I mean, some of this you're going to feel, and it's par for the course, but if you start to feel these more intensely or for prolonged periods of time, or they're really starting to interfere with functioning um, or interfering with, you know, with your relationship, with, with getting along or, or with other things, please talk to your doctor. Please you know, reach out and say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Um, it is really a sign to, to stop and reassess and say, OK, I need to, I need to reset here. In terms of physical well-being, you know, it's the backbone of stamina, if you will. Um, and I don't mean to give this list like it's a big to-do list. You've got enough on your plates already. But more to think about, there are lots of little things you can do that add up that make a difference. Little choices along the way. So if you have a choice between eating something that's more nutritive and eating something that's not, you know, 
maybe try to try to go for the nutritive one or um, to try to drink more, stay, you know, stay hydrated, um, to really prioritize your own sleep and rest. If your loved one is resting and taking a nap, think about taking a nap too. Yes, there's laundry, but there's always going to be laundry. And if you rest, it'll help you then, you know, for, for the longer haul. You know, pacing and stamina, we, we, we talk to patients about that, but it's true for family members too. Certainly keeping your own medical appointments, um, including preventive care, and that's like the car maintenance, like taking it into the shop every year for the tune-up. Make sure you get your tune-ups, because what often happens is that keeps getting pushed aside, pushed aside, pushed aside. Next thing you know, months, years go by, something accumulates in you, and then you aren't well. And that's a problem for you, but that's a problem also for your family. And another sign is to look for unhealthy coping. Um, smoking, drinking alcohol, emotional eating. You know, in the short term, they can help us feel better. In the long term, obviously, they can cause problems. So just, again, seeing that as one of those dashboard signals. Coping with stress and tension. Um, there can be a lot of buildup of tension, right? A lot of buildup. You're doing so much. You're pushing through a lot of buildup of emotions. Um, and often people are kind of stuffing and, and, and containing. Um, and it's almost like a pressure cooker. And it starts to build up to the point where it can, it can pop or it can explode. And so thinking about ways to actually you know, discharge some of that physical energy through, through movement um, and or turning it off or turning it down with relaxation. And often you have to do the first one first before you really can relax enough into um, um, things like, like meditation and, and prayer and so forth. Um, I sort of alluded to, to this in terms of, you know, we all talk about, yes, self-care is important, but how the heck do you do it? Sometimes it's doing it first thing, you know, having a, taking time for yourself, having a cup of coffee, reading the newspaper before everybody gets up. Um, sometimes it's scheduling it in, so like that therapy appointment or a walk with a neighbor. Um, sometimes it's looking for windows of opportunity. You're waiting in a waiting room um, and for hours, you know, can you get up for a few minutes and walk around, do, do a couple of stairs, or listen to uh, a meditation app on your phone. Um, do something you enjoy and, and notice if it makes a difference because that, that's the positive feedback you want to get. If you realize, you know, when I stopped and took that nap or I stopped and took a break, I felt different. Good. Okay, let's, you know, do more of that. Um, you both need to unplug. GBHD can kind of hijack your lives. It can feel like it, it's everything. It's every schedule. It's all the medication. It's all the symptom management. Um, there are different ways of unplugging. Respite doesn't necessarily mean taking a break going away or having somebody stay with your loved one. It can be even taking a break from the medical. So deciding as a family, you know what, we're not going to talk about medical tonight. We're going to play a board game or we're going to watch a movie or we're going to look through our old photo albums and we're just going to try to remember us, right? Because this takes over and it, we can forget who we are. We can forget who we were as a family, as a couple or ourselves. So things to help you feel normal, things to help you feel like yourself again. Um, coping with feelings, loss, change. You guys are feeling a lot, obviously, through this. Fear, hope, frustration, relief, guilt, gratitude. It's just up and down, twists and turns, a lot of uncertainty, and a lot of loss, right? A lot of loss of the life you had imagined, um, loss of being able to do certain things, loss of the imagined future that you had. Um, you know, loss of time, loss of independence. And caregivers often feel the need to hide their emotions or to be positive and not burden anybody. And again, that's that stuffing, that holding in, but it builds up. Um, and so thinking about ways to um, express and process those emotions. One way to think about it is it's really kind of a grieving process sometimes. Um, talk therapy is one of those ways, but it's not the only way. A lot of people journal, but there's another type of expressive writing that actually has about 20 years of research to support it, which is writing your deepest thoughts and feelings for 20 minutes at a time. You actually set a timer so you, so you don't you know, keep going and get overwhelmed, but 20 minutes at a time, um, but at least four times. So it can be once a, once a day for four days, once a week for four weeks, turns out it doesn't matter. There's something about getting it out, stream of consciousness, not trying to tell a co coherent story, not even complete sentences, just talking, just even if it's the same word over and over, 
doing that and then doing it repeatedly seems to help to not only get it out, but process and start to make sense of and work through it so that it, um, you kind of come to terms with it, basically. And it doesn't have that, that tension or that, that um, pit you know, that's, in, that's in your stomach. And so that can be actually very helpful. Um, there doesn't, it doesn't have to be writing, of course, art, music, photography, other ways of expressing and processing can be helpful. But I think, again, part of that is about grieving what used to be and, and acknowledging and feeling sad and crying and whatever it is that you need to do helps us to then accept what is and then to move forward with what will be and to then find new normals, to find ways to adapt, to find um, you know, things we used to love to do. Are there different ways we can do it? Um, again, a, a family I worked with, you know, still love to travel and hike. Well, their loved one, of course, couldn't, couldn't walk any great distances and couldn't be outside because of the sun. Um, and so they started to travel with another couple. Um, and the other couple, one of the members also had some mobility issues. And so they traveled together. And then two, you know, from the respective couples would go hiking and then they'd all come back and they would enjoy um, an evening together, and they just found a different way to travel. It wasn't the same, and they missed you know, the old life, but they found a good life uh, nonetheless. Um, and, so, and sometimes it's about really slowing down and taking each day as it comes and changing those expectations. Life is different with GVHD and after GVHD, and sometimes the things take longer and are more difficult. Um, but again, focusing on what's important, what's meaningful. Usually it's relationships, it's connection, um, it's children, it's animals, it's nature. And so try and identify what are those things that are really meaningful to you and can you have that in your life um, and have that ground you and maintain your sense of self. And one of the things that has always, always struck me in this, in this work, doing this for all these years, is the incredible, incredible resilience of the human spirit. Um, people say, how can you do what you do? Isn't it depressing to work with folks who are dealing with cancer? And I, I always answer the same way, which is it's awe-inspiring. It's just incredible. You all are here, you're survivors, you're adapting, you're finding ways um, to, to make it work. And inevitably, you will talk about how you, there are these little gifts along the way, or these little gems, or these silver linings, or these, these things that you find um, of, certainly with caregiving, that sense of reward, that it's that the incredible gift you're giving to your loved one. Um, the sense of purpose, the sense you're stronger than you ever thought you were, you never thought you could do something like this, feeling closer to one another, more compassionate for others, um, meeting incredible people you wouldn't have met otherwise. These are these things that happen along the way that, um, that are also part of the journey. And we actually can bring those up into the foreground, if you will, and you know, when, especially when there's so much negative, really kind of highlight that for ourselves. Take time to stop and, you know, and, and appreciate and remember. Um, some people keep a gratitude journal, so they try to remember something every day. Um, or even just taking a moment to, to appreciate something um, can, can actually help to counterbalance all that you're dealing with. So in summary, uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, Self-care is essential, and I hope, if nothing else, when you leave here today that you will feel um, at least just a little bit um, more that your self-care is critical and it is important to prioritize um, in order for you to keep doing what you're doing. Um, that you don't have to go it alone. There, there are lots and lots of resources and, and, and people out there. Um, but it's important that you get a chance to acknowledge your part in this and your experiences, your losses, um, as well as perhaps to do that with your family in creating new normals and, and celebrating gains and cherishing those small gifts along the way. So thank you so much. So... I, I, 
in order to do questions. You're going to do questions? OK. OK. No, not at all. Not at all. I was just going to say in the question, sure. question and answer that um, because GVHD is so different for different families and different family makeup is so different, um, I wanted to focus on the self-care issue because it's really a cross-cutting universal issue for all of you. But in this part, it's a chance for you guys to ask more specific questions if there are particular challenges unique to your situation that you're dealing with. But also, if you have pearls of wisdom that you've learned along the way, or um, ways that you've coped, or ways that you fill your cup or pump up your tires, that we'd love to hear that as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Bishop. Oh. Ooh, are you OK? <laughs> I'm attached. I'm tethered. <laughs> that was fantastic. Wow. So now it's time for questions, and we are going to be recording this. So it's really important that if you ask a question, you use a microphone. For our friends that weren't able to be here today, they'll be able to listen to the audio recording on the website. And so we're going to ask our two wonderful uh, speakers and panelists here. Any questions? Anybody? <laughs> it was so thorough. Yeah, hi there. I have a question about that list of, of uh, reasons that caregivers say, I, I, I can't take time for myself. You know, I don't want to be a, uh, a burden or I don't want to leave the person alone. I'm just curious, what, which of those things do you hear most frequently? Reasons that caregivers don't take time for themselves. I, I, I would I absolutely agree that, you know, feeling like there isn't time um, and then I think feeling guilty, you know, feeling that um, their needs are not as important, that the loved one's needs are by far, you know, more important and, and trump their needs. And so in the, in, in the short term, you know, we do put aside our needs and, and, and it makes sense to prioritize and push through and so forth. But again, I think when we're talking about GVHD, that's not sustainable. And, um, and so sometimes when I'm working with folks, we talk about how to pass on some of those um, other tasks, life tasks. So um, when they, the person is so busy and say, well, you know, as much as you want to pick up your child at soccer, maybe if you can you know, pass that on to somebody else and, and carpool, it would give you a little time to go do something that you need to do. And that's hard because they're competing needs, right? So we have competing needs with our loved one who's dealing with GVHD and us and our family's needs and our need to be with our family. <laughs> but again, I think um, trying to help folks understand that it is a way that you are showing care for your family. It is a way of caring for your family because if you know the stronger you are, the better off they are. But it's it's interesting. It's hard. It's it it's a it's a it's a it's a practice. Um, and I think um, sometimes there's some gender differences too. I think oftentimes women are socialized to um, to be more more in the caregiving role, and um, and they may be less likely to to feel like it's okay to get somebody else. They, we get a lot of messages we need to be superwoman, you know, and so, yeah. Does anyone have any of their best tricks and tips to share on how they fill their cup or what's worked? We're in the ballroom, and, and this woman we meet, and she's from... Indiana or what anyways she had to move back home because she wasn't getting care so there was no caregivers by her so she moved back home well she got GVHD so bad that she can't even eat anymore she's got her boost but she seems to have trouble finding help for her financially she's running an apartment now she can't declare bankruptcy and you just feel for these people and what can she do? What you know when it's not like we get wonderful stuff in Michigan, wonderful, and this poor gal, fifty-eight years old, and just feel. What, what do you tell people? Good luck. We'll pray for you. And 
no, that that's absolutely um, it, it's heartbreaking, especially the financial, the economic strengths, and um, when a patient doesn't have a dedicated caregiver. Um, we try and transplant. It's one of the, as you know, in Michigan, a criteria in order, because we know all the significant complications that can develop, that a dedicated caregiver must be present. And it's, it's heartbreaking when you do develop GVHD and there's so much dependence on another person. And when that's not there, it's, it's extremely, extre those cases are extremely challenging. Yeah, I absolutely, I agree. It's, it's, it's really heartbreaking. It's, I think, in pretty um, uh, encouraging that the organizations, like the three organizations we talked about today, do work really hard to try to um, identify all those needs. And I know well, all of them would certainly be the match, you know, also focuses a lot on, on the financial aspect. And a lot of folks end up sometimes declaring bankruptcy or really um, struggling with financial issues, even with insurance, um, because of out-of-pocket costs and, again, the, the longevity or the inability to go back to work. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think all three of the organizations have resource guides um, that list all kinds of resources, including financial, um, you know, resources. Um, but it's, it's not to say that it's, it's not an enormous challenge. And I think it's very difficult to build a support community when you're describing this, this person when they themselves are not well um, and they're not in perhaps their hometown, you know, and so um, to try to build it from scratch is, is, is tough. Um, but sometimes going to, um, you know, the spiritual community network or, um, you know, other um, organizations, local organizations that, that provide help, um, you know, the United Way often has a list of different organizations, so. Yes, yes, yes. And again, sign of resilience, right? You know, that, that continuing on the determination to keep going, to find the resources, to find the people. And she met you, who is incredibly compassionate. So that's part of that, that story, too. I might add to social workers. They they know of so many resources. Uh, our staff social worker, she finds these, just these unbelievable grants for people, and it's part of their job. So I think even going back to your center, or Gilda's Club, different groups that know LLS is f phenomenal, where you can find those resources and even a friend to be doing the research for you, looking for these resources for you. It, it's amazing what there is available if you just can look. And triage cancer, if you guys don't know what triage cancer is as far as finances, financials and insurance, they are very, very well regarded and I, I encourage you to go to their website. So, so these, <clears throat> these comments are probably more appropriate when someone is first diagnosed and has their bone marrow transplant, but to kind of build on your comment, you know, it really does really does take a village. Uh, so we live in Michigan, and my, my wife was treated at U of M, and we're like 120 miles away. Well, and it was in February, you know, so we get some snow in Michigan. And, you know, people were shoveling the snow, and then in the summertime when she had her bone marrow transplant, we, we uh, summered in Ann Arbor, and people were cutting the grass. So that was just, you know, one less thing off my plate. And also, uh, we had some. We have five adult children. A couple were out of state, so you know you're kind of a caregiver for your spouse, but you're trying to help your kids understand and cope with what's going on. So it's kind of a, you know, we're part of that sandwich generation, I guess, or whatever. Uh, and then Caring Bridge, uh, I was trying to work and, and be a caregiver, and and when we had our stay in Ann Arbor, uh, the caregivers were myself on the weekends, but then my wife's college roommates. Her, her siblings, friends, friends from our hometown. So you know, we shared that we shared that responsibility. Um, and then I found Caring Bridge to be fantastic because, you know, I, I'd, I'd be home, and the phone would ring, and I said, you know, I'm not going to answer it. I'm just tired of talking to people. And I think with Caring Bridge, everybody everybody gets the same information. 
you know, you don't forget something. Or, and, and my wife is very private, so she only wanted certain things shared. And that way we could kind of control uh, the story. And, and not control in, in a bad way, but just it was things she wanted people to, to, uh, to know. But I found that hard is that that phone just kept on ringing and people were, were, well, were well meaning, but you get burned out from telling the same thing over and over again. Just to add to that, and those are just fabulous points. Really appreciate you sharing that. Um, that you you know you're getting all those questions, and and then you're trying you know you're trying to answer, and that it gets overwhelming. Sometimes also you can be a kind of gatekeeper, right? So you're sort of protecting your loved one if they're tired or they're not up to um, socializing, and and so you're you're in that role as well, um, and and that can be stressful. The, the nurse said, as the caregiver, you've got to protect the patient. If they don't feel like having visitors, be strong and say no. Yeah. Any other tips, pearls of wisdom? I guess I'd like to just hear people talk about ways, uh, creative ways they've figured out how to turn down help uh, that isn't wanted. Um, you know, so many times people just come in with just way off base stuff, like, um, you know, even close family members who have been with you for years through the process, and and they're, you're, you're like a decade in, and they're still like, still not, like maybe you don't even know what GVHD is or whatever. So just ways to tell people to back off. <laughs> Hit it, Michelle. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a fabulous question. I, I just, and I, I wanted to hear what you do first. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you have experience in this. That's right. That's right. Do you want to talk about Yeah. I don't know. I guess I just recently had an experience where I was having challenges with my with my folks and uh my brother um just around where we're dealing with like um buying a new house so I can have everything I need on one floor and selling the old house and they're coming in with all kinds of crazy stuff that I, I can't fend off. Um, and I'm, as much as they're helping, I'm angry with them every day. So I don't, I don't really, I like everything. I, it's just about taking time and calming down is the only uh, backing away uh, from people um, for a long enough time so that I can then address them in a calm manner is the only thing that I could do sometimes. Sounds like it's a, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's tough. And that, that, I'm so glad you brought that up because I think it, it, it's, it's the flip side of help. So sometimes help isn't helpful. Um, sometimes it's well-meaning, but it's too much. Or you know, sometimes people talk about they're they're given 20 casseroles, and you know they can't possibly eat it, or they don't really like the food, or you know. And and what you're talking about is um, yeah. right, right. And and you know that, that people can be well-meaning, but sometimes it's it it just is too much. And and it sounds like you're really trying to set some limits and. You know, I think first and foremost, if possible, trying to communicate. Um, I know it's, it might sound overly simplistic, but really trying to, you know, like make I statements, you know, acknowledging the intention, it's positive, you appreciate it, but they may not recognize that actually this is more stressful, not less stressful for you. It's... Um, that a way that they could help you or better help you is to actually give you space and let you do this um, on your terms, on your own. Um, if there's a way that they, a different way that you think they could be helpful, maybe 
somewhere else, you know, uh, doing something else. You might, you might suggest that. So you, you, know, you might give them something, a task, and say, you know what would really help me is if you could research this. I'm trying to make this decision about a house. Um, and so they still feel useful, so they're not just turned away. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard because there, there are interpersonal challenges with personalities and with family and that just are there um, that can complicate, uh, you know, the situation. And, um, and sometimes when we set limits, family members get their feelings hurt or they get mad and we struggle to be sensitive to that while also taking care of our needs. And, and so, you know, of course, one possibility would be something like family counseling or you guys in your nuclear family, your couple, whatever your family makeup is, you know, you decide what you need to do and set those limits and you try to explain it respectfully and um, assertively and then you let go of what their reactions are because you can't be responsible for that. Um, and you, you try to do the best you can. You try to explain to them. Um, and again, you know, maybe give them options. But that's a kind of self-care um, you know, that we didn't, we didn't talk about. But that's really important, but also very hard. I so I like appreciate it. About your help isn't helpful. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, the, it's nice. a good, a, ni a nice way of saying, you know, well, we, we went through that where, you know, we have a family member that didn't, wasn't really around, but then it was all poor me and, you know, this is her granddaughter that is fighting for her life and you can't even come see her. <laughs> But then we're at fault because we didn't include her on stuff. And, and like, you know, with everybody that's fighting a disease, my priority is my daughter. My priority is not this phone. And as we said to numerous people, if, I, if we don't get back with you, don't be offended, you know. And we had a lot of people that were fine with that. And then I get the one that, whatever, but, it, 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 yeah, <laughs> it wasn't this, Grandma. <laughs> but it is. It's hard because I, we, I'm not one to ask for help. I'm not one to, you know, we're just very independent. And, and then all of a sudden, uh, <laughs> can you... All of a sudden, your granddaughter's not well, and then a week or two weeks might go by, and she might go, "Well, how's you like not having hair?" I mean, you just don't ask people this stuff. You just be empathetic. You know, I just I, I, I you learn how to use your words, and then I've learned that my problem, my my problem was laying in that bed. That's the only thing that I needed to focus on. And if you had a problem because you felt like you were left out, that's not my problem. You weren't there to help. That's not my problem. She's my priority. So, but I really liked how you said your help isn't very helpful. <laughs> I mean, and hey, people get, sorry, but people get butt hurt. <laughs> Nothing you can do about it. That's just how everybody can be. Thank you for that. What a session. I don't want to end this. <laughs> I see a lot of people nodding, and just the, this is terrific. Gentlemen in the back. Yeah, I, my wife and I have experienced this over the years. Uh, I was the patient, uh, she was the caregiver, not just with friends and family, but with each other. And I think one thing that's helped, to use that word we're talking about, is trying to avoid phrasing what we need 
as a negative. No, I don't want that, or that's, that doesn't help, or I don't like it. But rather, phrasing what we need and coming right out and asking for it, but as a positive, as a gift. For example, if, we'd really appreciate if you could give us the greatest gift right now is just give us some space or give us some time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that would be a, a way of giving us something. So whenever possible, I think people respond to the positives. Uh, I, I think that's well said, and I, I think that's a, that's a great kind of um, reframe in terms of the asking for help and, and I, seeing that you actually are making it easier on other people, right? If you can say, here's what would help me. And sometimes here's what would help me is not getting certain types of help and, and making that clear and, and um, rather than don't or um, more of a negative stance. So I, I think that's a great point. I think we need to wrap things up. I hate to do it, uh, but I want to thank our speakers and everyone will be heading back to the ballroom now for, uh, to regroup for the, the uh, networking sessions. And thank you all very much. <laughs>